Hey folks, Kiltman here, Kiltman at your services. How are you all? I hope you're all doing very, very well. Do you know what? It's gonna be a struggle to get through this video because if you're in the UK right now, you will appreciate it is absolutely hellishly hot. This heat wave, which came out the blue and just completely set all of British Isles on fire, is showing no signs of abating. It's relentless. It's horrible. It's clammy. I had a fantastic ice bath this morning. When I say ice bath, I just ran the cold water and filled it with cold water. And then I came down to the freezer and I got the little, you know, the ice cube blocks. Hardly an ice bath, I know. But I put all them in. So there's about 12 of them floating around. And then it got in. It was lovely for about five minutes. And then you kind of get used to it. And then, yeah, this is energizing, brilliant. Well, this will see me right for the rest of the day. And then you get out and you towel yourself down. And then suddenly the heat hits you again. And you need an entirely new bath. It doesn't make any difference. The heat, the humidity is that bad right now. There's no one enjoying this. Don't tell me you're not going, well, we didn't get a summertime, did we? Oh, no, no, we didn't get any summer. It was just rain, 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 rain. Well, you're fucking regretting that now, aren't you? Don't tell me you're enjoying this. It's horrible. Mrs. Kilman went out before to go and get some rations in for the clan. And uh, she called, well, she texted me, well, she actually texted me and said, like, it's raining, it's actually raining. So I, I ran to the window, she was like, I can't see any rain. It looks kind of grimy out there, in fact. Oh, God, these windows need cleaning, don't they? Mrs. Kilman arrived back and she was ochre tinted she went i was wrong about the rain i went what happened to you it was saharan dust which we've had a few times in the last few days but normally you just come out and the car's covered in it but she was actually out in it at the time and it just come down and she was like, oh, it's rain it wasn't it was grit and sand and dust carried over on these demon spawned clouds from north africa hmm, dear god so, the Rugby World Cup has started. Yes, the, I love the rugby, I love it. But I, I just sat and watched Italy versus Namibia and it was a drudgery, not the game itself, but just sitting there watching people exerting themselves. And you were going, oh, sweat, poor, poor, ooze, ooze, saturating everywhere. Oh, it's fucking wrong, I tell you, it's wrong. Anyway, anyway. Let's cut all this baloney. We got something to unwrap. Here we go. Now, you guys have seen this before, because I've had this for over a week now. And Ashrodyne, your friend of mine, Ashrodyne, a traveler in time, sent this to me. <laughs> and I've got a few other things arrived as well, and I've done those unboxings, and uh, greatly where to. Now, this is, I've been sitting on this one, waiting for the right moment. But anyway, we're gonna do it today. Now, what it is, there's been no huge preamble this time because basically he hasn't sent me any clues at all. So I can't work them out. I've got no idea what's in here other than the fact I think it's three, po well, I think it's three roll posters, I think. I did think there was a beach towel in there as well. Now, I know that sounds a bit bizarre, but Astrodyne has sent me beach towels in the past, but they've got film filmic merch cult uh, imagery on them and I thought I felt like oh that's a beach towel some kind of material in there but that seems to it maybe in the heat it's all it's all shriveled up so I can't feel that anymore and I kind of said is there a beach towel in there and he, he got back to like no I think you, you're looking more at posters really <laughs> so there you go it's posters posters of what I don't know now I normally have my trusty ski and do to slice open boxes and packages. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna need it with this somehow. I'm just gonna rip my way in here. So, folks, I don't know what's coming up here, but I would expect things of interest and greatness and uber, uber coolness. Uber coolness, what wouldn't I give? to be smothered in uber coolness right now, instead of being saturated with this goddamn heat. Oh, Christ. Oh. 
One. Two. Oh, there's actually four. <laughs> there's four. Okay. Well, they're rather handsomely packaged, aren't they? So, should we save them till last? By the way, I'm playing um, Elliot Goldenthal's uh, Supreme Score for Alien 3. I don't know why, because Alien 3 is dark, gloomy, and oh, ugh, shivery. All the things I want to be right now. Might be an easier way into this. Okay. All right, what have we got here? The blood. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you can see that. A Chuck Russell film. And I can recognise what that is right now. That's The Blob. That's the remake of The Blob. You know, the old Steve McQueen movie, The Blob. Hmm. That's interesting. I can make use of that. No, get your smutty minds off it. But the bits of polystyrene and bubble wrap and packaging come in really handy for when you've got masks and you've got dioramas to build and props to put in, in videos behind you. That will make a reappearance somewhere. Trust me. But the, uh, oh, I can't get it out. What was this? Was this 1988? I think it was, Chuck Russell, the remake of The Blob, and uh, with Kevin Dillon and uh, Shawnee Smith. Uh, oh, Jeffrey Dumont, <laughs> Dale from The Walking Dead. Candy Clark's in there as well. From Blue Thunder. And from, um, oh God, so many other movies. Oh, oh, that's stuck on there. Oh, I don't want to Oh, I think we're all right. This is... This is like vinyl. It is, it's, it's a vinyl poster. And it is, it's the, the main poster. The icky, the ickiness. I think, oh God, oh, it doesn't say. I think it was a fella called Tony Gardner did the effects for this, uh, which were obviously much better than the, the blob effects from the old 1950s Steve McQueen movie. But it's, oh, I've got the music to this. Yeah. Um, somewhere I've got the music to this. The blob, the blob, blob, blob. Michael Honig's score for the Blobby Arts. Let's play this. It's all electronics and synth. And yeah, yeah Kevin Dillon is the bad boy in the in the, the, the town. He's always in juvenile juvenile hall and all that. He, he rides his bike. He's got a big mad curly mullet. Nothing wrong with big mad curly mullets. And uh, although he's the town bad boy, he has kind of got a heart of gold as well. And he will be one of the ones that saves the day when the blob, which we find out, although it seems to come from space, then how is it all these chemical suited uh, military types want to just, you know, we're going to quarantine the entire area. Anyone tries to escape, shoot them. You know, because it's, it's actually one of their experiments. It's a, it's a biological weapon, the blob. And poor old Jeffrey Dumont, who plays the sheriff. I'm just thinking, he was Dale in The Walking Dead, wasn't he? But Dale wasn't a sheriff, was he? Because he played a sheriff in The Hitcher. He played a sheriff in the this. And I'm sure he's, he's a sheriff in something else as well. He always seems to be wearing a sheriff's badge and like a, a Stetson, a 10 gallon hat. But he gets uh, he gets blobbified, big bad time. He's got a hot for Candy Clark, who works in the local diner. And she manages to seal herself into a telephone kiosk and the blob just smothers the entire thing, but it can't get in there. And she sees a fella, Jeffrey Dumont, is in the blob and his face just comes apart. The blob effects are brilliant. It is gory. And Kevin Dillon's great actually in this. I'll try and show this properly. Look, it's just like someone floating in the big blobby viscous mess. That's how I feel right now. Like I'm just slowly you know, trying to move through the sluggish, blobified heat that we're all going through. And there you go, look at that. It's a good film as well. I think I've reviewed this on the channel. I think I have. I'm pretty certain I have. If I haven't, I will do. Um, you can get it on Blu-ray, um, but not from this country. 
I think I had to get like a German or Spanish import of that movie. But me and Mrs. Kiltman, when we first started going out together, went to see this. And Mrs. Kiltman does not like horror movies at all. Doesn't like science fiction. In fact, hates science fiction with a, a loathing vengeance. It's not too fussed on westerns either, for that matter. In fact, I can't think of any films that she does like. Kitchen sink dramas, that's what she likes. And um, real life stuff, real life dramas. And like most women these days, loves true crime dramas or recreations. Why is it with women and true crime? And women loving bad boys and stuff like that? I, I don't know. I really cannot say. But David Honig's score, Michael Honig's score in fact. It's nice and eerie. And some great gloopy effects in it. And Shawnee Smith is actually pretty damn good for like, she's the pretty girl who will fall for the charms of the bad boy, obviously. And uh, but they but she'll have to fight back herself and try to save some kids in the sewers. And Chuck Russell isn't afraid of having some of the kids getting killed by the blob as well. So it actually does break a few taboos. But yeah, we went to see it when it first came out. Weirdly enough, our first few movies together at the flicks were this, Halloween 4, and uh, oh, one of that, that could be here as well. That'd be, wouldn't that be weird? If, like, Ashradine's tracking my, my courtship with Mrs. Kiltman via cinema posters. <laughs> yeah, Halloween 4. Then we saw Cocktail, I think it was. Oh, yeah. I should add to the kitchen sink dramas. She loves anything with Tom Cruise in it. So, there you go. Or Brad Pitt. Ashradine, cheers, mate. Mmm. Mm. So the blob, it's great. Um, great effects, a reasonably interesting score. We like, I love all my synthetics and that, like. And it's gory, effects are great. And Kevin Dillon, who doesn't love the bad boy? You've got to turn to the bad boy to save your town. And he's, he's forever on, on his bike, he's trying to make this jump across this chasm. And we first get introduced to him trying to do that and he fails and almost kills himself. But of course, you know that's foreshadowing. He's gonna to have to make that leap at some point with Shawnee Smith on his on the back. And they're escaping from I think they're escaping from the military, and he's gonna do that jump across this collapsed bridge. And he does it and they get away with it, like <laughs> As remakes go, the blob is up there as one of the better ones. I think mainly because you go back to the original The Blob with Steve McQueen. Look, we've all got a bit of nostalgia, but for old vintage stuff, sorry, a message just popped up there on my phone and I, it was quite interesting, so I got distracted there. Now, uh, you, it's not a good film to begin with. It's kind of tacky and very cheap and threadbare. So the remake, even though it's a B-movie, it's still got great production values. Husky Dog, can't go out in this heat, it's way too much. And she's getting really annoyed now because she's, she sits there and glares at me because she wants to go out. It's just way too hot. So, she's got to obviously lubricate herself with fluids, as I've been doing. But of the remakes, which I stand by as being great films in their own right, and possible improvements on the originals, well, you've got The Fly, David Cronenberg. You have, of course, Philip Kaufman's Invasion of the Body Snatchers, one of the best remakes I've ever seen. And although I've talked about it a lot on the channel, I've never actually reviewed it, I don't think. But I should, should review it and should do a watch party for it. Should do. I owe it. I owe it that much, at least. And before you go, like, well, Kiltman isn't your favourite movie of all time, a remake? <laughs> the Thing? No, it's not. It's not a remake. And I had this argument only the other night, but unbelievably. Everywhere I go, everyone knows me, knows I love The Thing. So, which is another blob type movie in many ways, because it's a, um, an amorphous creature which is shapeless and can shape shift and do whatever it wants. And uh, But people always talk to me about it and they go, oh yeah, it, you know, it's a remake, don't you? And I'm going like, oh, hell. The original 1951 movie, I've talked about a lot and love and adore with a vengeance. But John Carpenter's The Thing is not a remake. It's 
it's another adaptation of John W. Campbell's original novella, Who Goes There? He's not remaking the Christian Nivey Howard Hawks 1951 classic. He's not remaking that at all. That was an interpretation of the original novella, which changes a hell of a lot. All Carpenter did was go back to the original novella and do an updated, you know, for modern audiences, 1982, uh, filmic adaptation of that. So it's not a remake at all. But alongside Invasion of Body Snatchers and The Fly, this is up there as one of the best remakes as well, because it massively takes the original story's concept and runs with it, gives it great new effects, gives it great new characters, and really, it's in a very, very enjoyable movie. Even though it's a B-movie, it's not as tacky and cheaper looking as the original, which I said that where nostalgia before, which plays a huge part in, you know, you're a fanboy, the films you grew up with, the films you, you first, you know, broke, broke your duck, with these into certain genres, they'll they'll stay with you forever. But the blob, for me, was never one of those. It was just a hokey bit of stupidity. Anyway, let's move on, shall we? Got another one here. Hmm. Deadly night, and it says. A Charles E, and you can't see what the rest of the name is, but I think I know what that is. That's um, Silent Night, Deadly Night. One of our oh, oh, another one of these. Oh yes. So you could have like a a really cheapskate lightsaber jewel. Couldn't you? I'm fifty four, you know. Oh, this is another vinyl one. So, mm, that I can't get out of it. Go down the same tricky road. Oh, we are. I've got a score for this somewhere. Yeah, this is a, a 84, sorry, 84, 85 uh, slasher movie. Spawned a franchise. Uh, gory, kind of notorious at the time. Oh yeah, oh no. I thought I got away with it that time. Oh, all right. Oh, it's okay. No major issues. Let's see if you can pl play the score for that. I've got, I have got that. Came in a fancy uh, cardboard sleeve with a few little um, fold outs as well. If I remember rightly. Uh, oh yeah, S for Silent Night. <laughs> there you go. So more eighties, um, fantastic, fantasticness, and there's the fake. Oh yeah, it's the famous image, of course, of uh, Santa. Or is he? Is he? Is he called Eric the Lad, who's who suffered a psychotic breakdown, um, and he hates Christmas and he's terrified of Santa. So he goes into like a, a mental institute, and when he gets released, he gets a job working in the, in the shopping mall. Fancies the girl there, uh, and uh, but catches her making out with someone. In like the uh, I don't know some back room somewhere, so there he goes ballistic and he kills him, and then goes on a murderous rampage dressed as Santa Claus. I mean, we've seen Santa Claus, the Dark Side of Christmas, uh, so many times, but that that poster became very very infamous. The Santa Claus coming down the air, uh, the chimney, but with a double-headed axe. Fantastic. Silent Night, Deadly Night. Oh yeah, a Charles E. Sellier Jr. film. Oh, that's beautiful. I love these. I love these vinyl. They are great. Look at that. And he uses axes. He uses knives. He uses everything. And the heads are coming off. And it it, it is quite a, a nasty film. As I say, it spawned a franchise. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how far they got into it, but it was like you got to like you certainly got parts two and three. Did you go beyond that? I mean, it's a long, long time since I've seen this movie. But pretty much everyone dies, I'm sure. There's an earlier film, uh, I think it's a British movie called Silent Night, Bloody Night. 
which has a similar sort of thing. It's set on Christmas Eve, and it's got uh, I think it's got John Carradine in it. And uh, is it a British movie? Mm, I'm not sure now. And again, it's all set around the festive season, and it's all about this the inheritance to this grand old house, and uh, and it's quite nasty for its 1972 something like that. Uh, quite nasty for its time. You got one poor guy with his hands cut off. He gets hit by his own car as well, like or something like that. And uh, lots of killings. People people get bludgeoned with heavy heavy objects. So their skulls are, are cracked open. And even older people are getting killed in it as well by horribly violent uh, methods. And it's it's a who done it as well. It's, it's like a Christmas who done it. So you got to try and work out exactly what. Well, Who's doing it and why are they doing it? And it's the person you least expect. Or if you're an aficionado of films like that, it's the person you go straight away. Yeah. Wheelchair be damned. Oh yes, you've got you've got no arms or legs. Don't believe that for a second. You know, it's one of those kind of movies. But this, that is a great, a great throwback to 80s stalk and slash. The best era for Stalk and Slash. Oh, cheers. I should I make that brilliant. Oh, are these, are they all basically the same? Where did I put them? Hey? Eh? Where did I put the oh. They're right here. They're getting submerged in all the packaging. So, listen to this. Uh, who did a score for this? Uh, Perry Botkin. And <laughs> my computer system uh, has put it under contemporary contemporary jazz. <laughs> it's a horror score from the 80s with a lot of stingers and zingers and a lot of synth and electronica. Cheers, y'all. Of course, like, if recently you've had um, Violent Night with the guy that played the sheriff in Stranger Things, the guy that played Hellboy in the ill-fated Neil Marshall Hellboy reboot, um, and he's Santa but on a really bad night, he's pissed as a fart, ends up in the, a hellhole uh, of wealthy bastards estate, which has just been taken over by John Leguizamo. I love, love that name, John Leguizamo, and his his mob of henchmen to try and rob the place blind because they know there's multi billions there in their vault. They're secure. It's, it, they, they've got more money than the Nakatomi Plaza, put it that way. But he ends up, he contrives to end up in there, and uh, he ends up having to battle all these guys. And but Santa can kick ass as well. So yeah, there's a long history of violence, Santa. Uh, stories. Of course, one of the best is Amicus Tales from the Crypt with Joan Collins, who gets harassed and haunted and terrorized by an escaped psychopath dressed in a Santa Claus suit um, <laughs> who's escaped from the local asylum. There's always a local asylum, isn't there? Why would you fucking move there? You know, oh, hang on, uh, we've done some of the searches here. Oh, is everything okay? No subsidence. Uh, there's no sort of county lines drug running going on. It's not, oh, no, 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 no. It's just a, 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 an asylum for the psychotic, um, deranged criminal murderers. You what? Uh, come again? Yeah, it's just it's just down the road. It's nowhere near. It's it's only fifty yards down the road from your front gate. Fuck that. And she gets terrorised by this this Santa. And uh, oh, this feels like vinyl as well. Oh yes, and um, but she battles him off and locks all the doors and the windows, and then she finally thinks she's okay. And the little kid is on the landing. Mummy, look who's here! It's Santa, and he's got this horrible face, you know, as if a kid had left that in, but dressed in the red and white, and with the big beard and all that, like, and a big sack of goodies. In his case, severed limbs and all that, like, and like, she's like, because that's the twist in the tale. This is a vinyl one as well. You know that? Oh, you know what that means? I've got another one of these things as well. <laughs> oh. What the hell would this be? 
Ooh, this is Lazzy Banded as well. That dog over there is not happy. Look, that's Josie Wales. It is, it, it's the outlaw, Josie Wales. It's Clint, it's, it's my main man, it's Clint. One of the best Westerns ever. Oh my God. You see, you see? Oh, you're gonna pull those pistols or whistle Dixie. God, that's, Ashodine, that's fucking amazing. Oh. Hang on, hang on. Yep, indeed. And in fact, I've got more. Outlaw Josie Wales, Clint Eastwood directed it, Jerry Fielding scored. Oh, hang on. I've got this somewhere. I've got to think on me on me feet here, haven't I? It's too hot for all the shenanigans. It really is. He's during the American Civil War. Josie Wales uh, fights for the Confederate. Well, he does join the Confederacy uh, to fight against the uh, the Red Legs and the Unionists because his wife and son get killed by Captain Terrell, played by. Oh, what does it say on this? Doesn't, doesn't have a cast list. Bill, Bill McKinney, I think, plays um, Captain Terrell and his red legs. And they burn his, his farmhouse down, his ranch, and kill, rape and murder his wife and kill his son. So he's destroyed. He joins um, John Vernon's guerrilla Confederate force and wages relentless war against them. This is just the beginning of the film. And then the war ends and they make a pact. And, you know, well, the war's over. Bring, they get John Vernon in there, the great John Vernon, as Fletcher. I think he's Captain Fletcher or Major Fletcher. And uh, so he says, you've all got to come in and surrender. But Josie Clint is like, I ain't surrendered. No way, they killed my wife, they killed my son. I see, a, I see a red leg or a blue jacket. I kill the bastard. That's my policy. <laughs> Uh, there's something I was going to say there to do with Dirty Harry because in Dirty Harry so I'm going to say it anyway John Vernon actually plays the mayor of San Francisco and you've got that classic scene of uh, Dirty Harry you've got Scorpio Andy Robinson is on the run but he's, he's holding San Francisco to ransom basically and uh, John Vernon and you've got the police you've got Dirty Harry's boss and you've got the chief of police there and, and John Vernon's the mayor and he's saying, like, look, you know, uh, Callahan, like Dirty Harry, you know, uh, we want no no trouble like you had in the, the Fillmore district. You know, that's not my policy. And, and <laughs> Dirty Harry says something like, uh, oh, what is it now? He goes, like, yeah, well, when I see a man uh, intent on committing rape, I shoot the bastard. That's my policy. And he goes, well, how did you establish intent, you know, to commit rape? Well, when I see a naked man, chasing a woman down an alleyway with a butcher knife and a hard-on. I don't figure he's out collecting for the Red Cross. And he smirks and walks out. And then John Vernon just says to the air, so he's the mayor, says to the uh, chief of police, you know, I think he has a point. <laughs> but John Vernon is in this. And he's, uh, so he's Josie Wales' former uh, commander. And when you all go into this surrender, Captain Terrell and the, these horrible Union bastard um, Northerners um, machine gun, Gatling gun the entire lot. Josie uses a trap, gets away uh, with one of the lad uh, who, uh, Joseph Bo Sam Bottoms I think it is, um, who gets, he dies further down the line. Josie then goes on the war path to kill up all the red legs and he becomes the outlaw of Josie Wales. So everyone's after him. Now you know this movie, you all know this movie. It's got Chief Dan George is in there, who's from uh, the, uh, the East Vancouver. I forgot the name of his tribe now, I really have. But he became a, a, an activist and a very 
learned person, um, a first nation, but he's he's in lots of movies, always playing, uh, you know, often comically. He's in Little Big Man with Dustin Hoffman, but in this he plays a uh, L- lone Watty, <laughs> and you've got because <laughs> everyone's after Josie Wales, Josie Wales again, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because it's it's so fucking funny. Um, he sneaks up on where he thinks Josie Wales is, and he's got a rifle. He's got an old musket, I think it is. Like, and suddenly you get. He's there. This is this is Chief Dan George, about to cock this rifle, and you get. And he goes. You know, the white man has been sneaking us, sneaking up, on my people for years. You know, like oh, but weren't you sneaking up on me? Well. You know, it's, there's a price on your head and all that, like. And he'll become like one of his confidants. Josie Wales says at one point, like, uh, you know, because he just want people hanging on. Everyone, he literally says, you know, uh, to, to Chief Dan George, Lone Watty, he says like, uh, you know, I get close to someone. They're not around for long, meaning his family and any friends, all the people he, he fought with. And, uh, and Chief, Chief Dan Joe, or Lone what he says to him, like, I've noticed that people you don't get along with don't last very long either. <laughs> it's genius. And he, he's, Josie Wales spits, you know, spits his backy out all the time. He spits on corpses' hands. He spits on that poor dog. The poor dog that joins in. He spits on the dog all the time. But he spits everywhere. And it's a, it's a, it's humiliation for the person being spat upon. It's, a, it's an act of defiance, an act of arrogance. It's great. But uh, what a wonderful movie. Um, one of the best Jerry Fielding scores and one of Clint's best directed movies as well. And um, the body count's stratospheric. It kills a hell of a lot of people. And he forms this huge sort of a uh, ragtag procession of people that, that just bond to him. He doesn't want any of them. He doesn't want Chief Dan George there. He doesn't want anybody there. But it, Son, Sandra Locke, of course, who he married, Clint married for a while. And in every film that he's got her in, The Gauntlet, uh, Sudden Impact, this, she gets raped. It's, it's, it's almost as bad as uh, Dario Argento putting his, uh, putting his daughter, Asia Argento, into all his movies, who gets raped or gets threatened and ends up being buck naked, you know. That's, but no, that, that's actually far worse because Dario's her dad. But Clint put his wife in these movies and she gets used and abused, but he'll save her. He saves many people. And the clever thing about it is because it becomes an ensemble act as well. So he's relentlessly hunted by other people and he's, his quest to take down Captain Terrell um, and all of the remaining red legs uh, we'll, we'll come to a huge big conclusion and um, but he'll stand alone against these or so they think I mean I think there's a whole platoon of these bastards and Captain Teddle is there like with his sabre and all that like and uh, like you've got no chance you can't take all of us I mean, who says I'm alone and they've got this adobe uh, ranch and all the little shutters come down and rifle barrels come out and it's all the people that have joined him you've got an apothecary you've got all the people, there's Sandra Locke and her mum, you've got Lone Watty and this other Indian uh, squaw, Indian girl that you pick up uh, because she's about to be raped again, again, rape again. And Clint saves the day, reluctantly saves the day. He doesn't want any of these people around him, but he finds redemption by saving these people because he's still, a, he's got a heart. I went the wrong side there, it's over here, isn't it, somewhere? Doesn't matter what, but I put my hands, I haven't got a heart. Or a liver anymore. And just to make sure there's no last vestiges of liver left. Just wash them out. Um, so he'll learn to respect other people and like, and learn to love the other people I've bonded to him and he finds humanity there. It's great. It's it's a kind of Mad, Mad Max does the same sort of thing. Well, Mad Max 2 does the same sort of thing. And then obviously Beyond Thunderdome goes even further. But without a doubt, 
Um, this is one of Clint's best movies. I, I think Western wise, well, the Dollar Trilogy for me is the high mark. The, the Magnificent Seven is one of my, my most enjoyable and favorite of American Westerns, but it's old school. But um, Ulzana's Raid, Bert Lancaster, I've reviewed that movie. Um, is still one of my absolute favourite Western movies and a brilliant, dazzling, brutal uh, reconstruction of what took place. Um, do check out that video. And uh, But Clint went on to make Two Mules for Sister Sarah, Hang Em High. Um, oh, God. This, what's the other one where he's swigging that, the big pot of, um, of, of ale? And he swings this pot as well and takes a guy out. It's rubbish. He made some rubbish westerns when he came back to America for other people, but when he made his own westerns, as in The Beguiled, um, a Civil War aftermath sort of movie, and a kind of dark gothic, southern gothic horror, that's, uh, that's excellent. This is outstanding. Pale Rider is outstanding. I'm sure I've missed one out there, haven't I? I have, I have. I can't think what it is now. But, um, but Clint had learned from Sergio Leone that, look, no one star is bigger than the ensemble itself. So you look at Fistful Dollars, you look at uh, a few dollars more, and especially the good, the bad, and the ugly, you've got a pivotal group of characters, one to two to three central characters who all interact throughout the entire movie. Sergio Leone and then did, of course, Once Upon a Time in the West, and other movies, of course, I know. But, and again, the same thing of having multiple characters uh, and supporting elements. Clint learnt that and realised, look, I might, I'm directing this, but I might be, and I'm, I'm the star of it, but I'm not the driving force. I'm only as good as the people who are around me, and my story will take on a narrative direction because of those supporting characters. And the outlaw Josie Wales absolutely, really, really rams that home. It's funny, it's very violent, um, but it is clever, and the dialogue is outstanding. And you've got that mainly from uh, Chief Dan George playing Low and Watty. It was so outstanding. Yeah. <laughs> no. there's, there's, there's too much to go into, and I'm going to misquote it anyway, so I won't go any further. But the outlaw Josie Wales. Oh mate, after dying, that's that's fucking boss that. I love that. Of course, he's using navy cults. They're navy cults. Uh, the thing I'm sporting is an army cult. Clint does use these occasionally in movies, but it's normally navy cults that he picks up. But wonderful, wonderful. And it's an epic movie, it's a long movie. When was this? Was this 74, 75? Josie Wales? I could be wrong about that. Um, but, oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? I know you've got the ring like, giving it, and it's all curled over. But you'll see this. This will be in the background when I come to review the movie properly. Oh, I should say the um, the finale, again, is outstanding with um. Uh, Bill McKinney playing um, Captain Terrell and the, the use of the sabre to impale him and skewer him is a, a, a nice finale, a nice fitting finale and uh, and you get the touching conclusion where he's got all his new friends and every the great Royal Dano or Real, Royal Dano is there as well and uh, all these very famous faces from not only westerns but from other Clint Eastwood movies. You've got like a there's a gang of uh, rednecks or I don't know bushwhackers who are going to rape Sandra Locke, and uh, it's it's the guy from uh, Any Which Way But Loose, uh, Every Which Way But Loose, and Any Which Way You Can from the uh, the Black Widows. You know the guy, the main guy, who's an idiot, and uh, it's him, and. Uh, <laughs> Well, he gets his comeuppance, obviously. And, uh, but at the end of it, his old wartime buddy, like Fletcher, John Vernon, the mayor in Dirty Harry, um, 
can quite clearly see, well, that's... Because he's... They, they make him go after uh, Josie Wales as well. and he, But it's his friend, his old commanding officer. He understands that they all got set up. But he's... Uh, I'm stuck with these guys now. But I still love Josie. And um, and Josie Wales is there. He's called, I think he calls himself Mr. Wilson or something like that. Isn't this glorious? And um, he comes out the uh, the saloon or whatever. He's killed Captain Terrell and all that. Oh, by the way, spoiler alert. <laughs> and uh, blame Astro dying, not me. I didn't know what was coming up, did I? And uh, and he's going like, what, what are you going to do now? You're going to hunt down Josie Wales, and he knows that's Josie standing there. And Josie's got like, well, what are you going to do? You know, have I got to kill you? You're my friend. Are you going to kill me? And I'm your friend. And he goes, oh, I heard, you know, the five people killed him. I don't believe the five people could try and kill Josie Wales. And they go, well, me, because they've told him this fake story that Josie was, was shot dead. I said, well, maybe it was uh, six or seven. Might even have been ten. And because they're looking at each other, they know he's still there. And Fletcher just goes like, well, I heard he went to Mexico. So, goes, so what are you going to do then? Maybe I'll go to Mexico, see if I can find him. And he's looking at Josie, and he goes, Josie's like, what are you going to do when you find him? Um, I'm going to give him the chance on me, because I owe him that at least. And, uh, and he's like, but hopefully... I can just tell him that the war's over. And you know, it's just like, oh, we're friends, don't worry about it. Because he spots that Josie's wounded as well, and like blood's dripping down onto his boots, and he, he clocks that and he's looking at him, so he knows that Josie's actually hurt. Not mortally, but just hurt. And I put all big respect and all that. And he says, like, I'm just gonna tell him that the, the war's over. And like, Josie just says, like, you know, I think a bit of a hang on what was it now we all died a little bit in that damn war there you go and the two had that sort of like no one else seems to notice this but we the audience really get that payoff Josie you're okay I'm not coming after you you're my friend big respect to you and Josie's kind of like Okay, gets on his horse, <sighs> off he goes. So I think I said before, like um, of his movies, uh, Josie Wales, The Beguiled, High Plains Drifter, shit, did I forget to mention that one? I did, didn't I? And Pale Rider, oh, you know, awesome. Uh, a lot of people rave about Unforgiven, uh, including me. <laughs> but I don't tend to watch Unforgiven very often at all. And again, you know, it's it, rape plays a huge part in this. Rape plays a huge part in a lot of Clint Eastwood movies. Not all, he's made millions of bloody movies, but it, it does, the pivotal ones, the Dirty Harry character, the um, his mammy no name, uh, Josie Wales, The Beguiled. Um, so many movies have this element, and uh, Clint's clearly got like, you know, look, I hate this, and I will depict it to a degree, but I'll make sure that in my movies, the people that do it, die. <laughs> Hence that line, you know, well, when I see a man chasing a woman with intent to commit rape, I shoot the bastard. That's my policy. <laughs> Genius, isn't it? Mm. We've still got, we have, we've got one more. Right, well, Josie, ah, oh, Josie Wales. I'm, oh, cheers, mate, that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I meant to show you this, didn't I? This, folks, does not show my political leanings at all. But I have this battered old Confederate flag, which I've had for most of my life, as it turns out. And uh, it's covered in cobwebs and stuff. But it's just, it's just a piece of flimsy old shit, to be honest. Nice prop in the background, but nowadays you can't really use it anyway. You can't, you can't walk down the street brandishing this. And they are not my opinions at all. But I, I, I love the history of the American Civil War and the combatants and the battles that took place. 
and I'm, I'm the North. I was definitely the US Army. And of course, the US caval Cavalry, subsequently. Right, let's see what we've got now. And it's, and it's another. This has got to be another vinyl one, hasn't it? Got to be. So let's get this out. Look, I'm loving these vinyls because like these, the canvases that Steve W. Seven Smith sends all the time, you see all around me here, they're indestructible and they're super light. So these things can go anywhere. We're lazy banded again. Okay, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show you guys. This will be upside down though, Milo. Oh, I forgot about that, didn't I? Forgot about that. What's that? <laughs> Lieutenant Frank Drebin. Leslie Nielsen. It's the police. It's no, the naked gun. It's the naked gun. <laughs> well, I didn't expect that. I'll be honest. <laughs> the naked gun. Uh, oh, God. That is another film that me and Mrs. Kiltman, otherwise, aka Janet, did go and see during courting days. Because that was, that was, was that 89 or 90? Something like that, innit? <laughs> look, look at the idiot. Frank Drebin. Fucking amazing. What did I just say before about the um, John Vernon? And um, Dirty Harry, John Lennon playing the mayor in Dirty Harry, and saying, you know, you know, we don't want an incident like what happened in the Fillmore district. You know, that's not my policy. What you get in that? Oh, I, I, I'm before we. Do I feel fucking stupid now, like with hair like this, especially? Um, I've got the soundtrack to this as well. N N N N N N naked naked. I don't normally have a trouble finding things with naked in them. <laughs> the naked gun. Uh, oh, sorry, what was the same? Here's the main theme now. In a second. Now, this should say contemporary jazz. It doesn't. It says nothing at all. Nice beaver. Thank you. I've just had it stuffed. Um, a stuffed beaver comes. <laughs> Priscilla Presley. Um, oh yeah, the John Vernon thing about that speech. That's my policy. You know. Well, <laughs> he meets. Who is she? She looks like Margaret Thatcher. But uh, is she the chief of police or is she the mayor? I think she's the mayor. And uh, he's like, we don't want any more trouble like we had in a uh, in whatever it was in Naked, in Naked Gun Universe. And this what? When I see five guys dressed in togas stabbing another guy to death, I shoot the bastard, that's my policy. And then he goes, Drebin, that was a Shakespeare production of, a Shakespeare in the Park production of Julius Caesar. <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> oh, sweet Jesus. Oh, God. OJ Simpson. Yeah, OJ Simpson. I know, I <laughs> he stumbles him up. The all the gang are on the boat there and he comes in like that and like manages to they've all got guns on him and he puts his foot in a man trap, puts his foot on the on the grill, smacks his face on the something, you know <laughs> and ends up falling overboard and drowning. And they've got the uh, the, the chalk outline <laughs> of the body floating on the water. <laughs> but he hasn't died. They the, 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 the made spot part two, part three. Uh, well Naked Gun 2, then Naked Gun 3.5, I think, or whatever they call it. Oh, that's fucking...
fucking awesome, isn't it? Uh, but OJ Simpson will come back throughout all these and be injured all over again, despite all the goodwill that they've all got towards him. Like, especially in Naked Gun at the end. I must kill the Queen. I must kill the Queen. It's Ricardo Montalban. The Great! It's Khan! You know, it's Fantasy Island. It's Khan! And Conquest of the Planet of the Apes as well. Uh, who's got this plan to uh, assassinate the Queen. Yes, the Queen of England, Britain, the UK, the ever dwindling Commonwealth. And now, no longer exists. Because now we have a king, King Charlie. Um, but it's like the baseball pitch in it and all that, like, and uh, <laughs> even at the end, you've got Nordberg, is OJ Simpson, <laughs> it's in the fucking wheelchair, and then at the top, and they go like, <laughs> they pat him on the back, and the chair goes down all the fucking steps, and then gets springboarded, <laughs> a dummy gets springboarded over, that's it. I know, oh shit. <laughs> I haven't seen Naked Gun for a long time either, but my god. Ah, oh, I've just remember another one as well. But uh, he, he goes into his apartment. I think the music's coming up actually. He goes into his apartment. Frank Drebin, that is. And uh, someone's already in there. So he, it's like tense, gets his little snubby gun out. Like, and like, he starts to. <laughs> Stop, man. Starts doing you know, cartwheels and you know, somersaults and ends up behind the city like that with the gun popped up. It's just fucking stupid. Nothing to see here. Nothing to see here. You've had a, a truck driving into a fire, a firework factory. So there's explosions and sparks everywhere. Every vehicle's on fire. It's just great. George Kennedy as his, his partner. George Kennedy is fucking amazing. And who knew that George Kennedy could do comedy like that? A big, tough, rough sort of guy in so many movies. Cool Hand Luke and many, many others. It's just genius. <laughs> I never fucking expected that, I'll be honest. Ashton, you, you massively throw me a bit of a, a wobbler there. I I, I, I thought, okay, poster-wise, we're going to have, um, there'll be something Outpost 31, something Thing-related. That's why I put that up. There might be something to do with uh, OMD. Great local British band in the 80s and ongoing. Uh, or Tangerine Dream or something like that. Uh, no idea. <laughs> An eclectic bunch. What have we got? We got the Blob, didn't we? We got um, Saturday Night Deadly Night. Outlaw Josie Wales. That's a fucking inspired choice, that mate, I'll be honest. And uh, and this? <laughs> I'm trying to think of all the quotes. I really am. And Priscilla Press is like, sucking one of his fingers. And, and he goes, I've got nine more. <laughs> Drebin. He, he, what is that bit? He, he, <laughs> the ongoing investigation. And uh, he, he goes out to try and clear his mind. And he's walking down the street. And they do that old film noir thing where the camera pans down to his feet walking on the sidewalk. His hands are in his pockets. And like, he's, you know, who was this bit? <laughs> who was this broad? Why was she so interested? What about so and so? And why did it do this? And who put that in so and so? I forgot all the lines. But then he goes, because the camera's tracking his feet, and he goes across a hopscotch fucking thing on the pet on the sidewalk. He does all that. And then he ends up walking into like marshland. And he goes, and so many other questions like, where the hell was I? <laughs> it's stupid. But that's the beauty. The beauty. Naked gun. It took like Airplane and Mel Brooks and melded them together with pure satire, slapstick, and you know, uh, inane farcical uh, dialogue. And Ricardo Montalban. You know, that fucking Vietnamese fighting fish. And like, you know, oh yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's put the, uh, the gold pen and he's skewed, he's accidentally skewed this. It, it's priceless, this this fish. And he skewed it to the death. It's also bit him on the nose, so his nose is going bigger and bigger. But he's trying to, and it's, uh, it's on his hand. His hand, 
Trying to hide it behind his back. And like, uh, uh, Lieutenant, I think there's something wrong with your, your nose. It gives him a handkerchief. And he goes, Quack, but there's your fucking fish is there. Dab, dab, dab. And only when he's gone, like, does uh, Ricardo Mountain realise, hang on, there's my priceless Vietnamese fighting fish with my priceless gold bullion pen. Skew it all the way through it. He goes, I know. Me just resizing it means nothing, but it is genius. Did not expect that. Where have I put it? I keep, put, I keep putting things in different places. There's packaging and all sorts on the floor. The posters are all over there. But these wonderful things seem to be everywhere. Look into my eyes. You're watching the white wand. All you're thinking about is the white wand and buying Kiltman a large whiskey. <laughs> oh dear, Ashodine Mace, that is a, a nice a nice little uh, surprising and eclectic bunch of um, posters and movies to talk about. And that isn't that great? You've got you've got mini you've got four mini reviews there of these movies. And um, one of which I have covered massively. That's the blob. But I think Josie Wales has to be covered properly. Although I've, I've pretty much, I've given you all the best bits already. I've bestowed you the best bits. Let's get, let's get Josie back out. Where the hell do I put that now? There he is. Really outstanding. And again, redemption of humanity. That said, he does ride off into the distance at the end. He does do that. And he's helped set up all these other people with an establishment and with um, something that could work for them. Well, I'm just trying to think, is he riding back out to the ranch? I can't remember now. Is he riding back out to the ranch with his main group are? And it's another group in the town. I've got to watch it again, obviously. It's a film that I thought I knew so well, and all of a sudden I'm going like, how did the, and, uh, I don't know. Break up. This is Drebin again. <laughs> Lieutenant Frank Drebin. Drebin! <laughs> that was a Shakespeare in a, in a Park production of Julius Caesar. But when I see five guys in togas stabbing another guy to death, I shoot the bastards, that's my policy. Fucking excellent. Right. Um, from me, from Kentucky, from the Xenomorph, from Bane himself, from the crew of Outpost 31, and from um, lovely Jessica Harper, Susie Banyan, who I've said many times now, um, one of the reasons why I went for Mrs. This, what would become Mrs. Kiltman. Uh, was because she looked just like Jessica Harper as she appears in Suspiria. That's, that's one of the main reasons. And uh, Suspiria is one of my favourite movies of all time. And my heart goes out to the, the, the character of Susie Banyan, played by Jessica Harper, all the time. She's heroic, she's resilient, and um, she goes through hell, and li almost literally. And... I found someone that looks just like her, and I put her through hell <laughs> ever since. Aha. Uh -huh. Can't deny it. Mm. So, anyway, folks, wherever you are, I hope you're comfortable, you're at ease, you're happy. You've got no strife. Or if you have got strife, you can you can get around it, you can overcome it. And I hope if you're in the UK right now suffering with this unbelievable heat. <sighs> Top tip for you folks. You know, hot water bottles. Hot water bottles. Yeah, yeah. They're big fucking floppy wobbly things. Like You fill them with hot water. They heat up. They retain the heat. So it keeps you warm in the winter. 
Did you know you can put cold water in those bastards too and it'll stay cold? And you put that in your bed on these nights. I got that from Kiltman. But guess what? We haven't got any. Which is why we've been suffering massively. And I, Mrs. Kiltman went out today to go and get the rations in. And I should have said, oh, go and buy a couple of them. Those floppy old school, bloody rubberized water bottles. Anyway, try and keep cool, folks. Apparently in the UK, we've got another night of this. Uh, and then I think things turn thundery, massively thundery tomorrow. But you've heard this before, and it hasn't really, it hasn't transpired. We've had little mini thunderstorms and like oh, a little, little tiny flash of lightning. Almost afraid to do the, the most sort of, you know, embarrassed, you know, bolts of bloody lightning. Uh, was that too much? I didn't want to upset anybody. And even the thunder's gone like, oh, oh sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to disturb anyone. Uh, okay, I'll, 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 I'll roll it back into the clouds. That's what we had over the summertime when the heat was getting more and more oppressive. Oh, don't worry, there'll be a thunderstorm to clear it. Ah, fuck off, it never happened. And then you got August, which was just rain. Rainy, rain, rain, rain. But still heat. And as I say, people forget this. People forget, we never got a summertime. Oh, shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. Back in June, May and June were hot and sunny for weeks on end. I know, I was hunting it all the time. But now, well, we never had a summer, so now we're getting this Indian summer. Uh, well, a uh, little note to everybody. We've always had Indian summers, always had them. September, October, we, we've, since, I've been, I'm 54 years old. I remember, oh, oh, the summers of 1975, 76, 77. Oh, God, yes, yeah, they were proper heat waves. Yeah, they were. We've had them since. I know, because I've lived all those years since. And every summertime, we do get maybe a week, maybe two weeks of unbroken sunshine. But it gets swiftly forgotten about. Oh, because you want six weeks, two months worth of unbroken sunshine. Well, well, be careful what you wish for, because now we're all fucking suffering, you know. Global warming, don't you know? Climate change. In the UK now, our buildings don't even stand up properly, because we've used RAC concrete. That's R-A-A-C. And I have forgotten what it stands for, but the word aerated is in there somewhere. So all our schools and all our hospitals are crumbling. They were built in the 50s and 60s with a, a duration of 30 years. And of course, it's it's coming home to roost. They're crumbling now. So once again, the UK, little, little tiny UK, little tiny UK, can't actually organize anything. Can't get anything straight. So even the Minister for Education, uh, start Keegan, her name is, F's and blinds and swears live on TV. Dumbass bitch, you know. You didn't do your job properly because, and then she managed to blame other people just because I, I'm doing my fucking job. What other people are doing their fucking jobs? They're sitting on their asses. This is what she said. No, 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 no. You haven't done anything at all. At all. You've known about this, and now all these buildings are beginning to crack and crumble. And they could, the ceilings could drop on people's heads. Did you know that in UK hospitals now, they're moving fatter patients to the ground floor? They are. <laughs> because they could crumble, fall through the floor and drop on someone else down below. What a fucking joke. We're, and we're tiny and we still can't get our act together. Our travel, our... Uh, Social infrastructure, policing, action. Oh, have I got a story about policing for you? <gasps> not right now. Not right now. No, not right now. Um, but it's only happened yesterday. So it's current. It's real. It's here. 
Um, oh, and I don't even mean the guy that escaped from Wandsworth Prison. I didn't even mean that. This is something local. This is here now. <laughs> God. This might cause problems. Just thought, Herman's Hermits and that, that suddenly might get this video blocked. After all I've done. But yeah, so there's much more to come. There'll possibly a video on um, inept law and order. I'm laughing, but I was involved in this. So I know what I'm, I, I know what I'm gonna tell you, but not right now. Um, you've got a country which is on its fucking knees because of the heat, it's, it's travel, um, infrastructure is is wasted. The strikes from every industry going. Uh, education's on its knees. The NHS is fucked beyond belief. There's conspiracies about Nurse Lucy Letby and all of that sort of stuff going on. Uh, no one trusts anybody. And we're that big. You've got America and all the stuff that happens there. Well, if you think about it, America can have all that because it's so many little... Every state's its own little country, its own little laws. They have all have different laws. You guys out there know this. And, you know, and, oh, your political system is bollocks, says the guy living in the UK, which established political systems and it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. It's bullshit. You know, you've got these learned people who are gonna make the rules and the laws for the rest of the population. And then you go into like this this room with all these chairs, these seated, you know, pews, and then hell abuse without using foul language. And they can't they can't clap or cheer. It's gotta be yeah, 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 yeah. fuck off. These regimented rules and these old dickheads who are just complete and utter imbecilic fools. Who just it, it's pantomime. It's a political pantomime. Well, it shouldn't be like that. It shouldn't, I'm sorry. You know, there's people's lives and livelihoods at stake with all of these people and their decisions that they make. And they they come a cropper every time they open their mouths or sign their name on some new law or regulation. I work with these bastards. That's why I left. I couldn't work with them anymore. They're all a shower of complete and utter wankers. All of them. All of them. So, we've moved from posters and, and great movies to the, the, the plight of British society. Having said that, there are some benefits. No, 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 no. Anyway, folks, I have been watching Shabby Man. Please, in the meantime, and it's ever uh, having to find space to put posters up in between time. Please keep it Celtic, keep it Celtic, and I am going to see you all. spit on the dog's head although she's over there my spit's not going to reach that far i wouldn't do it anyway but josie wales would i'm going to see you all ladies please take it easy be yourselves be happy and watch some of these movies josie and the blob especially because they're just they people forget about josie wales and they've definitely forgot about the blob i'm, I'm fairly certain no one ever talks about the blob but it's a, it's a much better film than people give it credit for. And um, anyway. Namaste. And I'm out of here.